Okay, so tonight we're going to do some revision on calculus. And when I say calculus basics, I'm talking about um, the cubic function. Um, and if you want me to, I can also do some questions. I've got a few, a little, a few questions uh, down later where, you know, you have to find the equation of a tangent or solve for a point of intersection between a tangent and a function simultaneously, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I've also got some rules for differentiation and then a couple of questions where we have to do it using first principles. But I imagine first principles by now is probably not something that you guys want to want to work on. Um, this question I chose because this is such a typical um, calculus type of question. Uh, and what I've seen over the years teaching and marking matrix, often what seems to happen is that matrix seem to become confused about how you calculate the X intercepts as opposed to how you calculate the coordinates at the stationary points or the turning points. So that's why I just wanted to go through all of this again with you. All right, and here we don't even have to find the equation of the cubic function that's given to us. They tell us that f of x equals x cubed minus x squared minus 8x plus 12. And in question 9.1, they tell us that x minus 2 is a factor of f of x, and they want us to use that to calculate the x-intercepts of the graph of f. All right, so Ideas, please. How should I start question 9.1? Calculating the x-intercepts. If x minus 2 is a factor, what should I write? Good, Kalipa. Y must be equal to 0, 100%. So we would have y is equal to 0. And then we've obviously got to have our x minus 2, right? So that's got to be there. What's going to go in the next set of brackets? Let's see what you guys are saying. Absolutely. Okay, so we need to have a trinomial, quite right. So, Kalipa, if we subbed 2 in there, we would get 0 as an answer. Okay, so um, we don't need to do that. We know that x minus 2 is a factor. What we want is the trinomial that we would multiply x minus 2 by in order to get x cubed minus x squared minus 8x plus 12. So over here, we would write this as ax squared plus bx plus c. That's it, Gugu. And now we need to work out the values of A and B and C. Okay, so how do we work out the value of A? Can anyone remember? Can no one remember? Someone may check. Should we give them a second to think about it, Yulinda? Yeah, maybe, because I know that they will throw something, at least something that they're thinking about. Mm. <laughs> and it's coming, you see, on the comments. <laughs> okay, so Siseko says first derivatives. So no Siseko, we would use the first derivative for question 9.2. We don't use the first derivative to calculate the x-intercepts. So for the x-intercepts, we've got to let y be equal to zero and we need to work out the values of a and b and c. All right, so Gugu, you are saying ek, that's it, Gugu. There we go, good. Well done, Gugu, that's perfect. Okay, so we are multiplying x with ax squared. So that gives us ax cubed. And we see by inspection that it is equal to 1x cubed. And now that our coefficients are the same, we can equate our 
sorry, now that our variables are the same, we can equate our coefficients. And just as you said, Gugu, therefore A is equal to one, good. Lovely. Now we do C next. How do we work out the value of C? What do we multiply together? Can anyone remember? Good, Gugu. Yes, 100%. You're on fire, Gugu. That's lovely. Well done. Okay, so we're going to multiply the negative 2 last and last with a C, and that gives us negative 2C, and we're going to make that equal to 12. Good, Gugu. So C is equal to negative 6. And now this one is the one that's a little bit more difficult. How do we work out the value of B? There's two things we have to do here. Yes, Seiko. Gugu's, <laughs> Gugu's doing very well so far. There's two multiplications that need to take place here. Can anyone remember what they are? So this is the hard one. It's that x there, whoopsie, just it, let it come to rest, with that term over there, and this term over here with that term over there. So when we multiply x with bx, we get bx squared, and negative 2 times 1x squared, remember a is equal to 1, gives us negative 2x squared. And that's going to be equal to negative x squared. That's it. That's it. Sorry, Lebochang. But there you go, quite right. And then again, now that all our variables are the same, we can say b minus 2 equals negative 1. Take the minus 2 over to the other side, and b will be equal to 1. All right, so now we need to go and put all those values in. So we have 0 equals x minus 2 times. 1x squared plus 1x minus 6. Okay, and now our last step, we need to do what to our trinomial? What are we going to do to our trinomial matrix? Factorize. That's it, Tehofat. So in capital letters, I love it. Okay, factorize. Good. Well done. Somebody else said factorize too. Sorry, I didn't see what you wrote there, but that is quite right. And then because we've got minus six at the end, we're going to use three and two. So it's got to be x plus three x minus 2, like so. All right. So this particular cubic function has two roots. One where x is equal to 2, and the other root where x is equal to negative 3. Okay, good stuff. Well done, everyone. Oh, so, Gugu, we just subbed in those values that we calculated, the a, b, and c, and then we factorized our trinomial. And then we worked out what the x-intercepts or the roots of this uh, particular cubic function are. Okay, so on the line where you have your factors, this line over here, make sure you write that it equals zero. Very important. See again here, I've got my zero. See again here, I've got my zero. Don't just write the zero once and then don't write it again. They want to see that equals zero on all the lines. Okay, especially the line that has the factors in it because this often carries an accuracy mark and you would lose that mark if you didn't have that correct. Okay, and a mark there and a mark there and then a mark for calculating our trinomial. 
No, level hung. So this is why I'm saying like students get so confused with this. And that's why I wanted to do this again. In 9.1, we are calculating the X intercepts. In 9.2, we're going to calculate the coordinates of the turning points. Okay, so when we are calculating the X intercepts, so let's just put a little note here for you. So for the X intercepts, we are going to let F of X be equal to zero. When we are calculating the turning points, that's when we let f prime x be equal to zero. Okay, because remember the gradient at the turning points is zero. Okay, so <clears throat> okay, all right. So students often get confused with these questions. That's why I thought I would do a reminder. All right, so now in question 9.2. The coordinates of the turning points, we have to take the first derivative and make it equal to zero. Can anyone tell me what the first derivative is going to be equal to? What is the first derivative in this case? You're welcome to unmute if it's easier than talking, I mean, easier than typing. What's our first derivative going to be? Remember, we're applying our power rule. So we're going to multiply our exponent with our coefficient. Okay, so Le Bukhang, we're going to take our exponent, we're going to multiply it with our coefficient, and then we're going to take one away from the exponent. Let's see Mamelo. Okay, and Kalipa and Zerofatso and Gugu. Nice guys. Well done. All right. So quite right. The next term would be minus 2x and 100% the last term would be minus 8. Well done to all of you. Okay, and is it Michael? Did I pronounce your name correctly? Kumutsile, you've also got the right answer. Good, good job, everybody. That's perfect. And again, the gradient at the turning points is zero. Okay. Mikhail, Mikhail, Mikhail. Okay. Yeah, no, we're not going to use the AX version. We're going to work from F of X. Okay, Le Bukhang. And the, at the turning points, the gradient is zero. And again, we must write that. Okay, because here we're going to get a mark for the first derivative. We're going to get a mark for making the gradient equal to zero. So very important that it is written. And again, at this point, if your factorizing is not your strongest skill, don't stress. We can always use the quadratic formula if we want to. So if we want, we can do this. And then we've got b squared, remember to put it in brackets, minus 4ac all over 2a. Or your alternative is to factorize. So we would have 3x in one bracket, x in the other. And now we've got to think of our factors of 8 that we could use in this case. So it would be 4 and 2. So I'm going to put the 2 here, I'm going to put the 4 over there, and we want minus 6 plus 4 to give us that minus 2. All right, so either or, either you've got your factors equal to 0, or you've got the quadratic formula, not both. That's it, Norman Corsi, good. So now we would write down either x is going to be equal to negative 4 over 3 or x is going to be equal to 2. Okay, so now that we have got the x coordinates at the turning points, now we need the y coordinates. What are we going to do with our x coordinates? How are we going to get the y coordinates at those points? That's it. We're going to sub into the original equation. Okay, because these points lie on the original cubic function, not on the graph of the first derivative. 
Okay, and don't be scared when you sub in an ugly fraction like minus four over three, we're going to get some weird, crazy um, y coordinate, and that's perfectly fine. So we're going to calculate f of negative four over three, and that's going to go into minus eight times negative four over three. Was it minus eight or plus eight? Minus eight, and then it was a plus 12 at the end. Someone can work out that answer for us. And when it comes to f of two, we already know that the answer is going to be zero. Okay, because we've that is our x-intercept. And our brackets doubled up. We had x minus two times x minus two. So we know that that point is a turning point and an x-intercept. Okay, was it equal to zero when you subbed in minus four over three? I'm just going to double check. plus 12. Okay, I'm not getting zero as my answer. What are you guys getting? There we go. Good, Kalipa. Yes, Lebohan, you just press the SD button and there's nothing wrong with that. Yes, Cheslin, quite right. Okay, 500 over 27 is the correct answer. Okay, so don't be scared if you do get a weird answer like that. It's expected when we are subbing in a fraction like minus four over three that we would get a strange output. Okay, so at our turning points, our coordinates are minus four over three and 500 over 27. And our other turning point is at two and zero. Okay, so I'm just reminding you. That's okay, Mamelo. I make lots of mistakes all the time, so no stress. So I'm just reminding you again, when you are calculating the x-intercepts of the cubic function, it's like calculating the x-intercepts of a parabola, a hyperbola, a exponential function. It's the same thing. Y is equal to zero. So f of x is equal to zero. When you are calculating the coordinates at the turning points, the gradient is zero. So we need the first derivative, and we've got to make that equal to zero. So that would be two of the four marks. The other marks are going to be on our answers. Okay, so on our x's and then on our y's. All right. Um, Bohale, that's not going to give us the same answer because Bohale, if we've got 3x minus 4 times x plus 2. When we foil out our brackets, we'd get 3x squared plus 6x minus 4x minus 6. So that would give us 3x squared plus 2x minus 6. And we want minus 2x. OK, so <clears throat> it's got to be 3x plus 4 and x minus 2. OK, so you can always just do quick FOIL just to check whether and see whether it works. If you know that your factorizing is not that great, you know you tend to make mistakes, then use the quadratic formula. OK, because then you're going to get those answers over there. Again, if you use the quadratic formula, make sure that you show that you have subbed into it. Don't write it down on the page with A's and B's and C's and then pick up your calculator. OK, you've got to show that you subbed in. All right. Okie dokie. Now they want us to sketch the graph of f, clearly indicating the intercepts with the axes and the coordinates of the turning points. So that's going to be our next task. All right, let's draw ourselves a set of axes. There we go. And let's get our blue pen back. And 
let's just remind ourselves about some key information. So we've got an x-intercept at 2 and another one at minus 3. We've got turning points at minus 4 over 3 and 500 over 27. So that's in the second quadrant. And we have got another uh, turning point we know at our x-intercept. What shape is our graph? Let me go back and rub this off. Is it concave up and then concave down or concave down and then concave up? What shape is our function going to take? There's the equation. It's concave down first and then concave up. That's it, concave down first and then concave up. All right, so it's going to, it's going to be one of those that looks like that. Okay. All right, so when A is positive, Cheslin, okay, so now the A that I'm referring to here is the value in front of the X cubed. So I'm not talking about this A over here. I'm talking about the number in front of the x cubed. So when that number is positive, the graph is concave down and then concave up. If that number is negative, then the graph is concave up and then concave down. Okay, but the one that we're drawing looks like this. Okay, and it's got to cut the uh, y-axis on the positive part. So it's going to come all the way up here. Oh, that's nasty. Hold on a second. Do a better job than that. At that massive big turning point, it's going to come down, cut here, do that, and then continue going. Okay, and then this point over here would be negative 3 and 0. This point over here would be 2 and 0. That point over there would be 0 and 12 from our equation. And then over here, we've got the minus 4 over 3 and that 500 over 27. Okay, so the 12, remember this value over here is your y-intercept. Okay, so for some reason, the y-intercept off often doesn't get labeled. So just make sure that you label that as well so you don't lose any marks because they want the intercepts with the axes and the coordinates of the turning points. So it's out of three marks. They're going to give us a mark on our shape. So in other words, concave down and then concave up. They're going to give us a mark on our x and y intercepts. And then the last mark that they're going to give us is on our turning points. Okay, everybody happy with that? Good stuff. Okay, and that was question 9.3. The other thing that I'm, I'm saying to you again this evening is make sure that you number things correctly. Okay, no one is going to make any assumptions on your part. If you meant 9.3 and you wrote 9.4 or 9.2, they're going to mark it like it was 9.2. Okay, and you're not going to get the mark. So make sure your numbering is perfect. Okay, just little things to be aware of all the time. Okay, so if we can do that without too much trouble, that gives us eight, that gives us 11 marks out of 14. So now if we want to get those final three marks, we need to be able to answer the next two questions, which are a little bit more difficult. Okay, now in 9.4, they've asked us to determine the values of x for which f of x times f prime x is smaller than or equal to zero. All right, so what we are doing here is we are talking about our y values and we are multiplying that by our gradient. Remember, these are just numbers. These are values, okay? And they want an answer that is smaller than zero or equal to zero. So that means these two have to have opposite signs. So y is positive, gradient is negative, or y is negative and gradient is positive. So in 
under these conditions, we either need to be um, walking uphill below the x-axis, or we need to be walking downhill above the x-axis. Does that make sense? Oh, no, Gugu, I didn't. Sorry. Where was your question, Gugu? The last question I saw was Puhlale asking me about the factors. Okay, and a whole bunch of you have said yes about walking uphill below the x-axis or walking downhill above the x-axis. That's the easiest way to answer that. That's okay, Amartya, welcome. If you want, uh, Yulinda can just assist you very quickly and just explaining what we've done. Yulinda, would you help Amartya quickly? Yes. Thank you so much. Okay, so go, go back to your question. Why is the graph concave down first? Okay, so um, you obviously missed that part, Gugu, when I was explaining it, all right? What I had done is I had gone back up here to the top and I'd put that circle around the X cubed, okay? So it's all about this over here and it's about the number that is in front of that. So the number that is in front of the X cubed is a positive one. So when the number that is in front of the x cubed is positive, the graph is concave down and then concave up. If the number in front of the x cubed is negative, the graph is concave up and then concave down. Okay, Gugu? Cool beans. Okay, I know we get busy writing things and then we're not listening because we're concentrating on what we're writing. Okay, so now looking at our graph, we need to be walking uphill below the x-axis. So that happens. I'm going to highlight the regions where this happens. Let's go with nice bright yellow. So here, I am walking uphill below the x-axis. Y is negative and gradient is positive. Then between 3 and my turning point, both are positive, y is positive and gradient is positive. Once I get past my turning point, y is positive, but gradient is negative. So now I have my y and my gradient have opposite signs. So this part of the graph also meets my conditions. And beyond my turning point of two and zero, y is positive and gradient is positive. So that's not going to be correct. Well, that's not what we're looking for. Okay, so in question 9.4, sorry, I was just checking on the numbering. We have two places where this happens. So either where it was including zero, wasn't it? Yes, it was. Okay, so either where x is smaller than or equal to negative three, or where x is a number greater than or equal to minus four over three, but smaller than or equal to, sorry, yes, but smaller than or equal to two. All right, does that answer make sense to everyone? Pumzi says yes, cool Pumzi. Is everybody else? Yes, Lebohan, good. Okay. <clears throat> yes, it is. Yeah, the gradient is zero. Okay, but it's allowed to equal zero. Okay, so we weren't talking about where was it strictly increasing. We were talking about our opposite signs. Okay. All right. If there's anybody, I see there's a couple of people. Yulinda, are you still talking to Amatle? Yes, I was, but Amatle is not responding to me. So. Oh, isn't she? Oh, okay. All right. Um, I know it's Sehofatso and Kalipa are just struggling with this concept. So I was just wondering if you might be able to lend a bit of support to either of those two people, please. Perfect. Okay, so it's um, Tsekhofatso and Kalipa. If you can just reach out to them quickly. 
Okay, perfect. Okay. And non jubulo. Okay. Then maybe this is something that I need to um uh, do on a little a little bit. Maybe what I must do is um I can come back and explain this again, but maybe give the others some work to do in the meantime, just so that we don't hold people up. Um, what I'm going to do, so just reach out to them for now. Um, I'll car carry on with question 9.5 in the meantime. Okay, all right. So now for one mark, they want us to determine the values of M such that F of X minus M has only positive roots. Mm. So what, what are they implying has happened here? So if I write f of x minus m, what am I, what am I implying has happened to my graph? Ah, good, Ntlantla, quite right. Yes, Norman Corsi. Yes, there's definitely been a shift, but in which direction? That's it, Cheslin. Good. Good. The graph has moved M units to the right. Lovely. Well done, everybody. That's brilliant. Okay, so we only want positive roots. Good, Lebochang. Good, Shreya. Okay, the graph has shifted to the right hand side. So <clears throat> In order for there to be positive roots, remember roots are x-intercepts, how many units to the right would the graph have to move so that it only had positive x-intercepts? Look at the picture of the current function and you should be able to work that out. Exactly, it's got to move at least three units to the right hand side in order to get one root, which would be zero. Correct. Okay, so that means that M has to be more than three units. Now, how are we going to write our answer? M needs to be bigger or smaller than? Okay, so M That's it, bigger than. Okay, so M needs to be bigger than negative three. No. Sorry, not negative three. Yeah, so it needs to be bigger than three. All right, so because of our sign, remember here they also played a nasty trick on us because they put the minus over there. All right, so <clears throat> if we've got this, then we know we'll have one root that is zero. Or if we had that, then we know so we no, we can't say equal to in this case. And the reason that we can't say equal to is because um, when this root lands up here at the origin, when x is equal to zero, it's not strictly positive. Okay, so it's got to be bigger than that. Okay, so it has to be bigger than three because it has to go just past the origin in order to be considered positive. Okay.
Okay. So, Pubzi, this is a difficult question. It's only out of one mark. Okay, so don't stress yourself about it too much. All right. What we were saying here is that in order for this graph to have positive x-intercepts, um, it needs to move to the right-hand side. So this x-intercept over here needs to move at least three units to the right in order for it to have an x-intercept at zero. Okay, but it actually needs to move just past the origin to where the axis of the so where the positive part of the x-axis is. Okay, so that's why the value that we would be subbing in here has to be a number that's three or bigger, right? Because if the graph shifted four units to the right-hand side, then this point over here would be at one and zero. Okay, so it's got to be more than three units to the right-hand side. Okay, so M would have to be greater than three. Was that, oh, it was only out of one. Okay. All right. Let's go and see Pleasure Pumzi. Okay, but don't stress about things that are one mark. Okay, if it doesn't make sense to you, this is a very difficult question. All right, so that's why it's more important that we can answer all the other questions. If we leave that one out, we don't get it correct, we can still get 13 out of 14, which is fantastic. Okay. Yes, so um, Gugu, I had written it over here. Okay, so it needs to be, it needs to be that. Okay, so that's why M would have to be greater than three. So three, greater than three or four or five or six or whatever the case, but it has to be greater than three. Okay. All right, let's go down here. And what I'd like to focus on for um, the next few minutes in our lesson is this particular question about the tangent to this function. And I want to focus on this because it also uses our simultaneous um, equation solving skills, which we know are so important for us in the maths syllabus. So they told us that we have a straight line g of x and it's equal to negative 8x plus 20. So that is a straight line in the form y equals mx plus c. And they've told us that it's a tangent to a cubic function f of x equals x cubed plus ax squared plus bx plus 18. And it tells us that it's a tangent to that function at the point 1 and 12. They want us to calculate the values of A and B. All right, so what do you think our first step should be? Aha, uh -huh. so we would get the first derivative, exactly, okay? We would derive 100%. The other thing that I just want to point out to you is that they've also given us a whole bunch of useful information. They've told us the x-coordinate at the point of tangency is 1. They've told us the y-coordinate at the point of tangency is 12. What's the gradient at the point of tangency? It's given to us as well. Can anybody tell me what it is? What's the gradient at the point of tangency? Oh, that's it, it's negative eight. Okay, now that's really important, isn't it? Because we're gonna need to work with that when we get our first derivative. Good, well done everybody. So it would be negative eight. Okay, now let's take our first derivative. So we're going to derive f prime x, and that would be equal to 3x squared plus 
AX plus B. So we've got our first derivative. Okay, what are we going to do now? What's the next step? Oh, have you, Cheslin? Oh, okay, cool. <laughs> this exact same question. Oh, wow. Okay, that's amazing. So you know the answer before we even get started. <laughs> Good. Okay, so we're going to sub the minus 8 into f prime x, and we would sub in x is equal to 1 as well. Yes, William, that's quite right. Yes, Lebohang. All right, so we're going to sub in f prime x. Remember, the gradient is f prime x. Okay, so we're going to sub in our negative 8 over here. And then we're going to sub in our x as well. And we're going to get an equation with a and b in it. So we'd end up with negative 8 is equal to 3 times 1 squared would be 3 plus 2a plus b. And then we can take that 3 over to the other side. So that would be negative 11 is equal to 2a plus b. And that would be equation number 1. Okay. What is the other equation that we are working with in this case? What's the other equation that we're going to work with? What are we going to do? Okay, but if I stepped into the straight line, how would that help me to work out A and B? If I worked with G of X, would it help me to work out A and B? There we go. That's it, Mamelo. Okay, so we have got to sub our point into F of X. Okay, because remember, we're trying to work out the values of A and B. All right, so we're going to sub the point they gave us into F of X. So we're going to say F of X is equal to 12. And then X is equal to 1 cubed plus A times 1 squared plus B times 1 plus 18. Okay, so when it comes to the derivative, we are taking the gradient of the tangent at that point, and we are subbing one into the derivative, and we're making the derivative equal to, a, uh, equal to negative 8. Then we have to sub the point into f of x, because remember, we're trying to solve for a and b. So now we get 12 equals 1 plus a plus b plus 18. And let's leave our A plus B on this side and take the other ones over to the other side. So that would leave us with negative 7 on the left. Do you guys agree? All right, and now we're going to solve simultaneously, and it's your choice. Either you can do this by um, substitution, or you can do it by elimination. All right, I personally prefer elimination. I think that's a little bit easier. But why don't you solve simultaneously, and then you can DM you, Linda, and I your answers. You take it from here. Um, Teacher Lee, while they're busy doing that, um, because I'm trying to explain the 1.4, remember the up, the up question. Oh, uh, okay. Are we still um, having difficulties with that one? Yes, please. Okay, so who was that? Um, there was quite a few of them. Some of them I didn't even get a chance to reach on them. Kalipa was one of them. Okay. Uh, All right. Okay, so can you guys take a screenshot of this? 
so that I can just move the screen up. Is that all right, everyone? Just take a screenshot. And then I'll come back down to this, or at least just write the equations down and then you can solve simultaneously. Okay, so I'm going to scooch up over here. All right, so Kalipa and the others that were struggling with this particular question, all right, they were talking about f of x times f prime x. So when we've got f of x times f prime x is smaller than or equal to zero, f of x is y, it's your output values. F prime X is your gradient. And we want that outcome to be negative. So we are multiplying two values together, an output with a value of the gradient, and we want a negative answer. So in maths, when we're timesing and we want a negative, the one has to be positive and the other one has to be negative. Or well, the first one has to be negative and the second one has to be positive in order to get a negative answer. Good, Mamelo. Well done. I'll be back down there now. So y is positive above the x-axis. So that's why I said when we are talking about y being positive, we're above the x-axis, gradient is negative, we are walking downhill. That's why I have highlighted this bit from here to here. Your outputs are positive, but your gradient is negative. Okay, so that's between minus 4 over 3 and 2. That's why we get that answer. Then our other situation was where our y's were negative. Y is negative below the x-axis, but our gradient needs to be positive. So we're moving from left to right. Okay, so that's this bit over here. From there, in that direction. And that explains that answer over there. Okay, so when x is smaller than minus, uh, smaller than or equal to minus 3, y is negative and gradient is positive. When x is a number between minus 4 over 3 and 2, y is positive and gradient is negative. Okay, Kalipa, does that make more sense? All right. Cool. Oh, good. I'm glad. All right. So, Mamelo has sent me some answers. How's everybody else doing with this question? Okay. So, so you got different answers to Mamelo. Okay. Gugu, you also, you got the same as Tsekhofatso. And Nawazi and good Amu. Yes, William. Okay, so Mamelo, something went wrong. We're going to go through it now. That's it, Amu. Well done. And you too, William. Good. You've got the right answers there. Okay. <clears throat> That's it, Mbalentle. Good. Well done, everybody. Nice work. So I personally prefer elimination, but you don't have to do it this way. I like to put the equations underneath one another, and I'm going to subtract. So I'm going to eliminate the Bs. So I've got minus 11 plus 7. So if I've got negative 11 plus 7, that would give me negative 4. And then 2a minus a would be a. Okay, good. Well done. And then to work out b, I could say negative 7 is equal to negative 4 plus b. And then b would be equal to negative 7 plus 4. So it would be equal to negative 3. Oh, sorry. Positive 3, isn't it? No, negative 3. Sorry. That's it. Okay. Well done, everyone. Okay. I hope um, 
Where was it now? Mamelo, I hope you can see where you maybe went wrong. With that particular question. All right, are there any questions? Okay, Mamelo, good. Any questions, guys? I'll take that as a no. Right, that's a very similar question in 8.3. All right, so what I think we should do is just to fill up our time, um, is I'm going to do a question. No, no, you wouldn't have to do that in this case. They just wanted the values of A and B. So, I mean, if you wanted to, you could write F of X equals X squared minus 4X squared minus 3X plus 18. But just working out A and B was enough. Okay, sorry, I didn't even show you where the marks would be allocated. So, that maybe I should do that before we move on. Okay, so usually... So we know that there's got to be a mark on A and we know that there's got to be a mark on B. So that's three other marks. There would have to be a mark for taking the derivative and making it equal to negative eight. Then there would also have to be a mark for subbing in the point. And then the last mark would be a mark for solving simultaneously. Okay. All right, so let's go down here. Let's have a look at question 8.2.2 just in the last few minutes that we are together. So here they want us to determine the derivative um, and they want us to obviously use our rules. So I just wanted to remind you guys when you are solving or taking or determining the value of the derivative, or taking the derivative, not determining the value of, of the derivative. When you're taking the derivative, remember your notation. Okay, it's very important when you're using the dx and the hard bracket that you don't drop the dx and the square bracket until your last step where you actually apply your power rule. Remember, we've got to remove divide lines, brackets, and um, roots. So in our next line down here, we are going to write 5x squared minus 3 over x to the power of a half. And then we are going to split it. Okay, so now we've got 5x squared over x to the power of a half minus 3 over x to the power of a half. And now in the first term, when we divide like bases, we subtract our exponents. So this is going to give us 5x and 2 minus a half leaves us with 3 over 2. In the second term, we're going to keep the three where it is, and then we've got to write the x in the numerator and change the sign of the exponent. Um, I hope I haven't done that too fast. Is that is everybody okay with that? Okay, I, I, I didn't go too fast. Okay, all right, cool. So, Yulinda, maybe just reach out to Pumzi, please. Okay, and it's, uh, I should, read. okay, no, it's fine. I'll reach out to her. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so Yulinda's coming to assist you, Pumzi. Okay, and now that we have written every single term with our coefficient, our variable in the numerator, with our exponent, now we are going to do the power rule. So the whole way through here, I didn't drop the dx or the hard bracket because I'm preparing the statement for differentiation. I haven't actually differentiated. When I actually differentiate, that's me doing the power rule. Okay, so with this kind of notation, 
we drop the dx, we drop the square bracket, and we just write equals. And now we're going to do our power rule. So we're going to multiply our coefficient with our exponent. That is going to give us 15 over 2x. And then we're going to take 1 away. So that would be to the power of a half. And then we're going to stop. And again, we're going to multiply our exponent with our coefficient. So a negative times a negative is a positive. And this would be 3 over 2. And then we've got to take 1 away. So that would be minus 3 over 2 like that. And you do not have to write your answers with positive exponents. OK, so you can leave it just like that and you will get full marks. Okay. All right. So there's the poll. While you answer that, I'll just go back here and just go and check. It was out of four marks. Okay. So here they always mark us on our terms. Um, I think there would be an accuracy mark for simplifying to this point. And then the other mark here would be, I would imagine, would be for writing that as x to the power of a half. Okay, so Gugu, when you've got y equals whatever it is, again, you've got to remove brackets, roots, and divide lines. So if you've got y equals, y equals, y equals, now your statement is ready for differentiating, that's when you write dy over dx. OK, so that's the line where you are, um, where you do your power rule. If you're not doing the power rule, you don't write dy over dx. OK, or if they gave you f of x, same story. You'd write f of x until you were ready to do your power rule. When you do your power rule, that's when you write f prime x. OK, so just be very aware of that because there are penalty marks on incorrect notation and we don't want to throw any marks away. All right, guys. Well, that brings us to the end of this lesson.